If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of the Mind Pump, look, for 41 minutes, uh, we do our introductory fun time conversation. We don't talk too much about fitness. It's a fun house in here. But here's what we talked about in that first 41 minutes. We started out by talking about artificial sweeteners and soda. I had an epiphany. About all of them. Yeah. Then I talked Mine about involved robots. Then I talked about the company Seed. Seed is the leader in the science for microbiome research and probiotic supplements. Uh, probiotics can be very beneficial, but they're not all created equal. There's a reason why we waited this long to work with a probiotic company. They're the best in the business. They're the best. If you go to seed.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump, you'll get 20% off your first month. Of the Daily Symbiotic. Then I talked about my new handgun training. I'm taking a course with my girlfriend hmm. on how to handle the handgun. Adam very, revealed very well. I don't know a lot. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, Adam talked about the Warriors. I guess they're winning in the sports ball games. <laughs> uh, I brought up Go the Warriors. I brought up how an old law in Arizona got overturned. Thank God we can use nunchucks now in Arizona. Yeah. Uh, Roundup, another big fucking lawsuit. Are you guys causing cancer again? Uh, and then why we love Organifi so much, it's because they have all organic supplements. Protein powders, green juice, red juice for your, before your workout, gold juice to help you sleep at night, detoxing supplements, uh, immunity supplements, my favorite, Organifi Pure, which is a all-natural organic, uh, what is that thing called? Nootropic. Thank you very much. I need one right now, don't I? Wow. Look, you must run out of your Pure. If you go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump and use the code Mind Pump, you'll get 20% off. Uh, Adam brought up our new playlists on Spotify. If you want to work out to the kind of music that we like to pick, go to Spotify and check us out. Justin brought up uh, his new love of metal music, but it's a different kinds of metal. What's it called? Gore Grind. Uh, also, I want to mention that we are having a live event soon at Manhattan Beach in Los Angeles. It's coming up. It's on June 6th. You can still sign up. There are some tickets left. Go to mindpumplive.com. All right. Then we get into the fitness part of this episode. First question, what are the pros and cons of doing cardio before weights or after weights? The next question, what should a woman's focus be for fitness and health before, during, and after pregnancy? The next question, what biomarker do we think will offer the most benefit to people, uh, to the average person? For example, blood sugar or blood pressure. We think continual glucose monitors are going to be revolutionary Great part uh, of that episode, of this episode and that part. Oh, yeah. And the final question, uh, what should we look for in a business partner and what are some red flags? So we talk about why we like each other so much in that part of this episode. Also, uh, like it is that. May. That means next month is summer. If you want to get lean in a hurry, our best calorie burning, fat burning program in a short period of time is MAPS HIT. HIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training. Um, the program is written uh, expertly with barbell complexes and dumbbell complexes in different levels for different fitness levels. The program's 50% off. It's half off right now. Go to MAPSHIT, M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T dot com and use the code HIT50, H-I-I-T 50 for the discount. Do it quick because this promotion will not last forever. Let me clear my throat. Uh, 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 what song was that? That's a biggie song. That wasn't Biggie. Let me clear my throat. No, uh, no, no, uh, no, 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 no. Justin, help me out here. Do you remember that hip hop song? That's what it was. A, it was a. I want to say eighties. It was, it was an early hip hop. Oh, song. you know who that is? That is uh, Run DMC. Was it Run DMC? Let me no. clear my throat. Uh, uh -huh. Or is it? Um, Are you just throwing names out there? No. Uh, you got what I need. It's not that guy. No, not that dude. Is that Run DMC? DJ Cool. Uh, DJ Cool. Now, DJ Cool. Was he, he was connected to that group, though. I, I don't even know. Digital who Underground? Is he part of Digital Underground? I don't even know no. who DJ Cool was. I just knew that song. So I said it like I knew, like, oh, it's DJ Cool. I don't remember who DJ Grandmaster was. Flash did uh, a hip hop, 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 hop, hop. Yeah, don't, don't stop. stop rocking to the bang, bang, bang boogie. boogie. Up, jump, That's the right. Boogie, the boogie, the boogie, the boogie. And something like that. Yeah. 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 Probably fucked up all those When words, you're eating but... at your friend's house and, the, yeah. and it tastes like wood or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a great. That's back when hip hop. I loved it though. Hip hop was about parties. 
Yeah. You know, back in those days, it was about fun and parties. Not so much about bitches. And then in the 90s, it got dark. Yeah. There's still- That's when it got- It did. Logic yeah. just did a, a, a new song that is- to that, to that beat, that theme. Uh, it's Rapper's Delight. That's the name. Oh, Rapper's I love Delight. Rapper's Delight. Yeah, yeah, Delight. yeah, yeah Rapper's yeah, yeah. Delight is the name of that song. I, couldn't, I was like, God, it's running the time. I know, that's annoying. That, he did a kind of a, uh, what do you call that? A, a tribute, I um, guess, to- Homage? Yeah, homage. That's the word I was homage. looking for. Homage. Thank you. Yeah. What is it? Homage. I don't know. Is it homage or is it homage? <laughs> He's you, know, you pay homage. You pay homage. Pay homage was an, you do, it, it's an homage to it. Is, Are Doug, you sure? Wh which one's right, Homage. Doug? You pay I think homage. homage is the French pronunciation of it. Oh, it's, so, <laughs> so, yeah. I, I think went Justin all the way has French. got a good for, French For our accent. French audience that's yeah. listening right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mais <laughs> Mais yeah. <laughs> I know things. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, Doug was an English teacher. Yeah. In uh, it was in Japan I to children. Know, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn last night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, but hip-hop, remember, and then they would do, uh, remember when dudes would just start breakdancing and they would get... Uh, uh, cardboard, cardboard box, like yeah, walls. Yeah, bro. Put it on the ground, and that then was do. that was the way. Did you ever learn how to break dance? Uh, I, I feel tried. Like you, you yeah, were, I knew it. I would spin, and I was a big into spinning. He has a good bottom for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do, I, yeah. I did use my ass to spin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. quite like, a bit. Wore a hole in the cardboard. And I did all these like fake <laughs> yeah. moves that were like you know the like how you get into the flow of it, and then I never got the flow. That's the easiest <laughs> part. Oh, yeah, yeah, the easiest part where you're like crossing what's that your legs. one? What's that one move that they do? Like it's like the, it's like the a spinorama. Kick no, it's like it's, that's not what it's called. <laughs> Fliparama. No, it's called continuation. Yeah. That's is that really called. a name? Yeah, I think it's called the continuation. No way, I didn't even know yeah. that. The helicopter spins. It was the one where you spin on your head. That that was like, I tried that I think one. that's called a head spin. Yeah, a head spin. If I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah, but, right. the, but the continuation is like the kickflip in, in skating. Like when you're learning how to skate, uh, it's like there's there's a, there's people who can kickflip and people who can't. There's is that a big like difference. Like the staple move, is that what you're saying? If you can do continuation, you're like, oh, you can break dance. If you can't do that, you're not, you're not really. Yeah, you ain't no B-boy. I don't. I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I think Sal and I have too bony of an ass. We would have tore up the cardboard. It would have never I would, worked. I would have, yeah. would have drilled a hole in the floor. <laughs> Bro, I had a tracksuit and everything. Man, I got down. No, you didn't. I did. Oh for man. For like a, a split second. I still have some. I got some. I brought it one time. Remember, I wore my my full my full tracksuit. You just look like a like a. You just look like <laughs> a mafia even, guy. like a Russian mafia. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's like selling his car. You don't look like a b boy. Yeah. Yeah. You look like a guy selling me a car. Yeah. <laughs> I give yeah. you a good deal. Yeah, it's great price. Yeah. Hey, Dude, you, you so, got you got to share with uh, the listeners the you you wrote a really good post um, yesterday, I saw, and it's getting some really good traction right now. And I loved the way that you presented the information, Sal, on artificial sweeteners. Yeah, you know, this is always there's always this debate, um, or there has been this debate of, with artificial sweeteners in our space. And on one hand, you have the people who are like, it's perfectly safe have as much of it as you want. There's no real side effects, nothing to worry about. On the other hand, you have the scaremongering. It's going to give you cancer. It's going to eat holes in your brain. Uh, super bad for you. Avoid at all costs. Yeah. And I think if we're being totally objective and honest um, and we're looking at the current research, the current research shows that they're probably not toxic and they're probably safe for the periods of time that they're that they're being studied for in these studies. Now, the thing about studies that's important that people need to kind of understand is that studies are never perfect, and they will provide us with some answers, but they can't possibly provide us with all answers. And the thing about human studies that's real difficult is that in order to really nail down as much information as possible about whether or not something is safe or not safe or what, what the impact it has on someone, you have to have a completely controlled study which would require you to take a bunch of humans, have them live in a laboratory, and monitor everything that they did, everything that they ate for years, which is impossible. It's not going to happen. So most of these studies are observational. Nonetheless, artificial sweeteners are probably safe, but that's not the... But, but, and I, but I still tell people not to use them or not to eat them, and it's not because I think they're necessarily bad for you, although some studies show that they do alter the gut microbiome, which we'll get into... But the reason why I tell people to avoid artificial sweeteners is because they encourage the overvaluing of food for its hedonistic uh, pleasure. Like if we look at food, food provides so many different things to us. Part of what food provides us is the pleasure of eating the food. That's the hedonistic value. But there's so much more that food provides us, right? Provides us with nutrients, nourishment, 
energy. It provides our, our there's, there's a, a context many times, connecting with people around you. There's I, Actually, if I were to make a list and break down all the potential benefits of food, the list would be almost endless. But we focus so much on the hedonistic value of food that whenever we think of whether or not we want to eat something or not, we base it entirely on whether or not we just want to eat it because it tastes good. Purely on pleasure. Or because it feels good. Now, the problem with that is if you, when you're with artificial sweeteners, it tends to encourage that because it doesn't come with the natural barriers and limitations that foods with sugar and calories have. So let me explain. If you're a fitness-minded person, if you're somebody that really cares about your body and you want to look good, and you go eat something that has sugar in it, the natural limitations of the fact that it has sugar and calories will probably get you to uh, monitor how much you consume. Like, okay, I'm only going to have one because it's 200 calories and 50 grams of sugar. So I'm only going to have one and I'll have one every once in a while. But now that we have this sugar-free, calorie-free option, now I feel like I can indulge and always consume this, this, this food that's only really being valued for its hedonistic value. And that encourages a bad relationship with food. It's a poor relationship with food. Because if that's all you ever do with your food, you're only, you're, what it's going to look like is I eat really, really strict and restrict or I go way the fuck off and quote unquote enjoy myself with the flavors and tastes of food. So I have never in my life worked with a client where we have incorporated regular daily use of artificially sweetened sodas and they just had a great healthy life. It was always that was always a part of something that I have to remove and say, okay, let's, let's get rid of this and see what happens. And it's funny, after I did that post, I had a lot of people comment and be like, that was me. Mm. Like, I know there's no calories, but uh, because of that, I would just consume the shit out of it and then it would encourage other, uh, other eating behaviors. And that's what we find too, is that people c- consume lots of artificially sweetened uh, sodas and whatnot, tend to have poor uh, you know, eating habits with other types of foods. And this is true for lots of different things. For example, if we talk about sex... When we eliminate all the potential consequences of sex, which like pregnancy mm. and STDs might be a couple consequences, if you completely eliminate all that stuff, and then if you completely eliminate the emotional consequences of sex, let's imagine you could just have sex with whoever you want and there was no potential consequences. Could oh, you imagine nice. the negative behaviors that we would uh, create around sex, the impulsive uh, behaviors that we would. Why do you think I'm afraid of robots? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, I mean, the, robots are the artificial flavoring of sex. It's a uh, dude, hundred percent. You get a bunch of AI robots that are just like humans. Yeah, and you'll get some some poor behaviors as a result of that. So that's my big argument. And if you want to have a long, uh, you, you know, long term health and fitness, you got to look at artificial sweeteners that way, and and look at the the foods and say, okay, this is not encouraging. Good behavior patterns. I thought it was. No, just, I like that. I, like I thought that it was just great. That's why I'm glad you uh, we were talking about it because I feel like this has been the message that we've been giving around it since we've started this it podcast. Uh, but I thought you you articulated it so You've well. In on it, yeah. yeah I think that's because re- uh, people will see me have a diet coke every once in a while, and what I what I remind them is I I don't look at it, I don't demonize it. But I'm also very aware of the behaviors that it leads to. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, I'm. I'm. I'll the first to admit that I can go no co- diet cokes whatsoever. Then all of a sudden it's at my house and it's one every couple days. Then it's one a day. Mm-hmm. Then it's two a day. Then it's four. And it's very easy to justify because why? I'm not. I'm not getting fatter from it. It's not making me put on a bunch of weight. So you just keep doing it. You keep doing it. And you and, indulge in that. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so. And then, and then there's that side too that, uh, like, I just think that there we there's a lot of things we don't know yet about the body, especially when you talk about gut. Like, we're still learning so much, and whether I use things like, you know, I don't blame like those, you know, artificial sweeteners or maybe all the speed stacks or all the sugar that I consume uh, for these things that have in my body. But w- what has caused me? At the age of 26, all of a sudden to get psoriasis, and all of a sudden now in my 30s, there's certain foods that I eat, and I'm you know shitting myself on the on the toilet like 30 minutes later. Like you, you got to ask yourself, like something, some chemistry inside of you has changed over the course of 15, 20 mm-hmm. years of whatever said habit that I was doing yep. to do that. And so for me, 
I'm not sure what that is, but I've gone through and I'm like, I look at some of my own behaviors and I see the way that I abused ice cream. I see the way that I abused sugar. I also see the way that I've abused artificial sweeteners. And to me, when I look across the board of all the different foods that I've, I've consumed in my life, those are the main ones that have been major offenders. And so I'm very careful about how much I allow them and I introduce them into my life. Not that I'm demonizing them and saying that, oh my God, mm. they're going to cause cancer in me. Oh my God, it, everything that's gone wrong with my body, it's You're their just fault. Just being objective and right. self critical. You know, it's like, what am I actually doing? And, uh, you know, in terms of like what's reoccurring the most in my day to day process, and, and food is a big part of that. And now consuming these foods, uh, you know, for a long period of time, like what has this done? Has this benefited me? Or has, you know, have I noticed other things that come along with those choices? And, and I think that everybody just needs to evaluate that process and stay in tune with that process. No, I mean, look, this this is true for all behaviors that in this category of where you, where you start to indulge um, and you become impulsive. Um, look at, so you start consuming artificial sweeteners, no calories. Okay. That encourages me to consume more and more and indulge more and more. That starts to bleed over into the way you start to view food and it makes your food relationship uh, not as good. This is true for, look at pornography. If somebody's consuming lots of pornography, what they'll find is that their consumption of pornography will become more and more novel. They'll require more and more uh, you know, whatever, you know, different weird categories of porn to elicit the same kind of response. This happens with food as well. So if I'm always having this, because just because there's no calories doesn't mean nothing's happening in my brain. I'm obviously perceiving it as being sweet and palatable, right? I'm obviously perceiving a sensation. So as I'm perceiving the sweetness over and over again, what's going to end up happening with my other food choices? Other foods that are healthy are going to start to taste more and more bland. I'm going to start deriving less and less of that value from those types of foods. And I'm going to start craving more and more foods that are hitting that sweet and hitting that hyper palatability harder and harder. This is why when you come out of a fast, you go and eat a food that normally is like not a big deal, like an apple. And all of a sudden you're biting into the most delicious, sweet tasting thing you've ever had in your entire life. And so it just doesn't fit in with a healthy lifestyle. But back to the gut microbiome. Uh, artificial sweeteners do alter the microbiome. Now, to be clear, we don't know if this means it's a good or a bad thing, um, although sucralose in particular has been shown to kill off what we know and deem to be uh, certain types of beneficial bacteria. It also, by the way, is stored in the body. Uh, we thought that we got rid of it completely, but some of it does get stored in the body. That was Something relatively recent. Again, we don't know if it's necessarily bad, but it just goes to show like the more we learn, the more we're like, oh, we didn't know that. Oh, we didn't know that. Oh, I'd rather like err on the side of safety. You know, but speaking of the microbiome, uh, we got a lot of questions. I, I wanted to bring this up. We got a lot of questions on uh, the seed episode when we talked to the CEO from the from seed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and people were just like blown away by the information and wanting to know a little bit more. And I wanted to be clear because I had said something about the difference between the male and female products. So I have the information right here because they have a male product, a male uh, probiotic, and a female probiotic. And the, the female probiotic helps with dermatological health and natural folate production in the body, which is crucial for fertility and pregnancy. The male product has two separate strains that help with muscle recovery after high intensity exercise, and these are actually backed by by studies, which I fucking love. That's amazing. That's why I love this company so yeah. much. Is they're so like on top of the studies. But if you are consuming artificial sweeteners, I think it's probably a good idea to also have a high quality probiotic um, to potentially offset the maybe negative effects you may have on now, your gut. Now tell me if this is because I was actually just having this conversation uh, with one of our trainer buddies, Ben. And he was asking me uh, my opinion of the probiotics. And, you know, he's like, you know, do you take it every day? And how, can you feel the difference of this and that? And I said, of all the usage, like I've, I've been, I've tried on and off probiotics for a, a very long time. And the biggest difference that I notice, and this is kind of how I utilize them. And Sal, correct me if, if this is worth my time or not. 
But right for the most part, I try and eat a very well balanced diet and get most of all my you know beneficial healthy bacteria through my food. I try and get as much of my nutrients that I need, and then when when I feel that I'm lacking or I potentially may be hurting my gut, I try and use it like that. So for example, when I I know that uh, whenever I have cheeseburgers, it's either the the dairy, uh, the cheese, or it's the 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 bun that affects me. I get I get bloated. I retain a bunch of water. My stool is off. And something that I've noticed is if I it, when I get in the habit of always making sure that I have my probiotic when I consume something like that, it really mitigates yep. th- those those symptoms. I don't seem to be as bloated. I don't seem to hold as much water. My stool doesn't isn't off. And so that's kind of how I have used it. Am I doing it wrong? And is that okay? No, no. That's now that's symptomatic uh, use. So you're using it to mitigate a symptom. But it also helps with the – so when your gut is off and you've got like bloating and diarrhea and all that stuff, that's a lot of gut inflammation. And that inflammation tends to become systemic. So the fact that you're noticing less of those effects by taking the probiotic with these types of foods, that's a great, that's a great option because it's mitigating the, the inflammation that comes – because here's what happens when you get this kind of systemic inflammation. People don't realize – studies show this, by the way. People feel irritable and more depressed. So it actually affects your mental state. Of, well, I mean, I could tell you right away, mm-hmm. like there's part of the the quote unquote guilt that I get when I eat off of the, the you know, the plan eating wise is like just like the day before I'm like, man, I'm feeling good. <laughs> Diet's good. Training good. Yeah. Stomach is flat, tight, feeling good for my workouts. Then I'm like, oh, I'm going to indulge. And I indulge and I have something off and or I over consume and I know I over consume. And part of that guilty feeling is the is the feedback and the reflection that I'm getting in the mirror and looking down at my stomach all bloated and feeling lethargic. And then like, I mean, nobody likes a terrible poop. A ter- <laughs> I mean, a, that'll ruin a day. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, I, get, uh, I, get, I, hit, I hit the start over. Button. Right. Like, yeah. I, mean, I mean, how many times have you like, fuck, I don't even want to start this day just because the poop was wrong. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you come out, no. yeah. you start your 7 a.m. shit and it's no good. It's like, oh, great. It's going to be one of those <laughs> I'm days. I'm going right in the shower. But tell me you have a great one. You have a great one. It's like, man, it sets the tone for the day. So I could totally tell how those things have this trickling effect of how Dude, I Dude, I get irritable, and it's not just because I'm upset that I had a bad poop. I literally- <laughs> Although that happens too, though, Yes, right? although I, I do, I literally get irritated. Like, I'll come home, and the kids will just get on my nerves, and, mm. and I'll even for, have forgotten the fact that I my gut was a little off, and Jessica will be like, are you feeling okay? And I, I'll, I'll stop and, and think for a second, be like, I feel irritable. Yeah. Like, I feel, and it's because I'm, I'm a little bit more inflamed, you know, and I just kind of feel kind of crappy, but right. <laughs> it's funny, that's that's old old man wisdom. My grandfather used to tell me that all the <laughs> hey, time. Hey, speaking of you and Jessica, yeah. I saw you guys uh, at the at the gun range over there. Yeah, huh? dude. Look, little look at you. Pew. Look at you, Magnum P.I. Yeah. No, we took, huh? we took a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that reference. No, <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we were thinking about getting a, a handgun and um, wanted to be real responsible. And I have shotguns before, and... I, you know, I have a shotgun um, and I have some experience, but we want to be real responsible. So we took, we signed up for this three day course where we go in and they go over everything, uh, you know, types of uh, ammunition, types of handguns, how to load them, you know, how to hit your target, that kind of stuff, how to be safe, how to clean them because I want to be responsible. But it's pretty cool. That, that whole world is like so deep. It's so deep. Like he's going into like the history of, this is why this one's called the, 38 special and this is why this is a 357 magnum and this that and the other you see why it creates like fanatical people right fanatics bro right fanatics and all the custom parts you can get for them and all that stuff yeah so i'm leaning towards i you know i love berettas my dad had a beretta i've I've shot a beretta a million times love the way it feels glock i like i I might want to get a glock they're they're light um, the, I like the, the nine millimeter. Yeah. yeah, you want? Yeah, you like the nine. I just like how, yeah, consistently accurate I can shoot with that. Yeah, stop talking like you know anything about guns. That's it. That's the only one. <laughs> <laughs> that's like my. That's like my Sal's you, sports you, analogy. That's the only one you know because you watch Lethal Weapon fucking five times, yeah, bro. Yeah, Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you watch me in range, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we should go. We should I'm totally down. Go. Yeah, I'm already. I've already taken all my my tests. What's the biggest handgun you've ever fired? I've shot it like one of the forty four mag. What's the big dirty hairy one? Yeah, that's a that's a 357 Magnum. Is that what that is? That's got a lot of kick, man. Yeah, no, it does. It's because it's got a lot of gunpowder. It's a big ass oh, casing. Yeah. We did we did <sighs> a massive kick. My so my two best friends, one of them's really into it. Um, 
one of them, that's what he wanted to do for his his bachelor party. This is, I think it was the most ironic bachelor party ever. We went to Vegas, which is not ironic for a bachelor party, but did zero of the normal bachelor party type stuff. Like we did like, the, we raced go-karts. We went to a shooting range. We did like all these other things. We did a, 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 a what he called it, a man, man decathlon. Man we, decathlon. Yeah, man yeah. decathlon, where we had all these things that we did. And we were all competitive with each other. And one of the things we went to, one of those shooting ranges where they take you out and we shot all these like machine full, guns oh, and shit. Fully automatic. Dude, I'm all and, about it. Let's yeah, do it. Yeah. yeah, no, it was a lot of fun. There's one where you they'll take you in a helicopter and you'll fire out of the helicopter <laughs> and shoot at targets and shit. Like one of those little mini gun things. Or? I don't know if it's a mini Holy gun, shit. but how fucking awesome would that be? Yeah, no, it's dope. Yeah, hit that guy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I shot a desert, I think it's called a desert eagle, and it's a 50 cal handgun. If I'm not mistaken, and it was like that's crazy. Oh, bro, it's like you're yeah. like holy shit, like it gives you a black eye. Yeah, what am I trying to do? Is shoot down a, a tank? Yeah. <laughs> that thing. <laughs> yeah, he was going over armor the, piercing, bro. He was going bullets. over all the different rounds, and I never knew what full metal jacket meant. Do you guys know what that means? You've heard the term full metal jacket. Yeah, right? it's like a full uh, bunch of ammo, right? Huh? Full j- jacket of, of ammo. Well, I don't know if you uh, do. What do you mean by that? What do you mean? <laughs> full metal jacket. It's like a, the, the sleeve is all full. I don't know. Tell me, dude. <laughs> nine thought, milli- Hey, nine millimeter. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. So when when they when they switched from black powder to smokeless powder, smokeless powder uh, produces a lot more heat, hmm. and the lead bullets were expanding in the gun a little bit, and it wasn't it wasn't good for the gun. And and so guns weren't lasting as long, and they were causing problems. And so what they did is they started to encase the metal, the lead bullet, with a I forgot what kind of metal they used a jacket fully around the bullet, so that it, the metal, the lead wouldn't wouldn't melt, and they could fire it with this you know smokeless Boy, powder. You got like the full yeah. uh, tour well, this here. This is this yeah, is my this the... is my I love nerdy shit like this, right? So, but what's crazy is that is that these metal these full metal jackets just fucking pierce shit. So they, they had to figure something out because cops would or people would use them and they'd shoot someone and it would kill like four of the people. I could just see you, I could just see you and Jessica showing up to the range and yeah. Jessica's like, "Ooh, I want to shoot this cool shit." And sounds like, "Sit down. I want to know the history behind this." Actually, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> actually, no, it's just, no. You know, it's the teaching, order. You know, Jessica's it's like, the "Let's class? shoot this motherfucker." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sounds like, "Let's learn about this." Actually, those museum guys. Those curators. <laughs> why did guys? they yeah. Why did they make this? Yeah. No, you know what's funny? So the, the guy teaching the class is he's in his he's got to be in his seventies old dude from a totally different generation saying, without realizing it, he made a couple sexist comments. Jessica and I were <laughs> fucking crap. He didn't even, he didn't, you know, he's like, so where do you guys, uh, where do you guys get this one thing? And nobody answered. And he's like, come on, women, you guys should know this. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> and he goes, you shop, you know? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> he's making a sexist joke. He doesn't realize he's being sexist. Uh, and his wife was talking shit to him the whole time. But he's actually sitting there and giving us like this history breakdown of the different kinds of guns and why they load this particular way and why there's, you know, whatever. And I appreciate that kind of shit. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's really cool. Here's a musket. It, yeah. yeah. Actually, that would be fun. You can go and you can, there's places where Have you can you go seen, and shoot do, do black guys, powder. Are you serious? Have you guys yes. ever seen the viral YouTube video of the, all the people shooting the elephant gun? No. Oh, Doug, you have to do go. This is where it knocks people go, over. Yes, go to YouTube Elephant Gun. I'm sure that will show the the, the it's like the number one viral video. Oh, where like and everybody it, falls over. Yeah, it's just a ton of people that are shooting this elephant gun and watching all of them. It's fucking hilarious. Oh man! You know, last night I got a I got a group tag. So I'm in all these group threads, right? And um, uh, when we're last night, the Warriors are playing, and so I'm now like, they crushed, right? Yeah, I know. I got a text from you, which was crushed. So, it was so funny. It was uh, <laughs> I'm like I'm in like three of these threads, and we're all going back and forth, and and you know some of them are not Warrior fans, and they so made the most baskets, and so we're talking shit back and forth, <laughs> and I actually almost fired back on the on the because I thought you uh, were being sarcastic because I thought you were another one of my buddies. And I didn't realize, I was like, this came from Mind Pump Sal. Let's see, yeah. talk about the Warrior game. You didn't watch the game. Did you watch the game last night? Hell no. I was at the gun the gun class, and someone in the class, the, the, the instructor, the old instructor or whatever, he wanted, to, uh, he, he wanted updates on, on the game. So when we finished, he's like, all right, what happened? And they said, Warriors 100 and something to... So I'll tell you the... That's not the one, Doug. So I'll tell you the heat that I'm getting from my buddies... And and I, and some heat on social because some people have heard me say this. I don't give a fuck. Come at me because I'll I'll have this debate with you all day long. Kevin I Durant. yes, I've yeah. been saying since the day we 
brought Kevin Durant. As excited as I was, guys, and let me start this with, he is, in my opinion, if not the best basketball player in the world right now, he's number two right behind LeBron James. For sure, I don't disagree with that. But I 100% believe, and have been saying this since the beginning, we are a better team without him. Mm. And that statement just ruffles so many people's feathers. There's a lot of people that when Kevin Durant came to the Warriors, everybody, oh, they're ruining the NBA, and oh, you have all the best players, and oh, five all-stars starting, this is lame, everyone's all upset about it, and I'm over here going like, I, take him, I don't want him, we're a better team without him, and so we, I've been in this debate with my buddies, and it's been, and Kevin Durant got hurt a couple games back, so the last two games we've played without Kevin Durant, and we've won, and the first game that we won without him, there's nobody, I guarantee, that was watching that believe, except for myself and my buddy, who I, I was telling him, I can't wait for this game. It was during our talk. It's why I was outside. I, I yeah. had to hear about it because yeah. I called totally it. Totally predicted it. Yeah, I yeah. called it before it happened. I said, watch us win this game. We're going into Houston. By the way, nobody has won in Houston since before February. Yeah. It's a do-or-die game for Houston. That's they, rough. They have to win. Their, their backs are in a corner, right? Kevin Durant is out, so our best player is out. We're going to their home to play. The odds were against us on Vegas. Everybody said we're going to lose. I say, watch us be play better as a team and win. And we're all odds are against us. We did. Then we come into our first game against Portland, hammered him there too. We're a better team. We play better without him. And the stats prove it too. The last 29 games that we've played without Kevin Durant and Stephen Curry is starting, we are 28 and one, and this is such a. I love this because it's a it's a microcosm of what happens in business and in life. That doesn't the, a collection of all the best people don't always make the best teams. Yeah, that's true. And and the cohesiveness uh, and and leadership of, of a team, whether we're talking about business or we're talking about sports, is so tantamount to their success. And I'm telling you right now. The Warriors are such a cohesive group, and we added this superstar, Kevin Durant, and yes, he is the best. How long has he been on the team? Three years now. Oh, okay. So he, they were already killing it before him. Yeah. we we won, So what happened was we won a championship, then we had a year where we had the best record, and then we lost to LeBron James in the championship. Then the next year, then Durant comes on, mm. and we win two in a row. Mm. And Durant was MVP, and no doubt he is that good that he can take over a game but our entire game changes like you can see the way we coach and we play mm -hmm. we it's when he's in yeah, you got to feed him the ball yeah you have to feed him the ball because he's a monster and everybody backs off and just lets him take it. and yeah. because he's the best player 50% of the time he still makes a bucket doesn't matter if everybody's guarding him but now when he's not there we have to play like a team we have to screen we have to move now we, what if they do both th that's the problem though here's oh, yeah. the problem when you have all these great players, what do you know comes with a bunch of great alphas, great leaders, a bunch of egos, mm. and a bunch of people that want the limelight. And everybody else on the team, Clay, Steph, you know, Draymond, they don't need the limelight. They've all been able to, even though they're all great, they're okay with not scoring any points that game. I'll mm -hmm. let you score, mm -hmm. Sal. You're doing better. I'm very, yeah, very much more unselfish. Very about similar it. to the cohesiveness of this team right here. I mean, individually all of you would go on to do something great in fitness and be very successful part of what makes the success of this team right here is the ability to let others lead when they're great when they when they they highlight and and, and not caring i could go weeks and not be leading the team right, right, yeah right, i don't right, care right. Hey, you could you could be leading it for months in a row and then all of a sudden it shifts the other way yeah, like yeah, yeah. we're okay with it because it's not about us it's about the team and about winning right. that's why you, whenever we're in our team meetings you always hear me reference the warriors and the how are the players mm -hmm. And I really feel like Kevin Durant had, completely changes the chemistry of our team. And on paper, for all the assholes that are shaking their head right now that are listening to this, <laughs> on paper— No, 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 right. no. Well, it'd be like us. If we said, let pick, pick out one of the most famous fitness people right now that are popular and make a lot of money, successful in business, and just add them to our arsenal. On paper, we would be a better squad. But do we know if we would technically be a better team and be as successful as a business? Mm. I think you guys would all agree that that's it's not necessarily true. We have an example of that when we first started. I mean, Craig Caperso is a very good friend of ours, extremely intelligent person. It's a very business savvy person for sure. But the cohesiveness of the team and the dynamic that we had when he was kind of part of the group was completely different than what it is now. And I believe we're stronger even with someone that is that smart, that talented, and that could technically add value but the cohesiveness 
of the team mm. matters more. You almost you're so close to getting me to want to watch basketball. <laughs> <laughs> not there, not quite. Almost though, I'm almost ah. Never mind. Yeah, you so almost I, reference <laughs> Craig as uh, Kevin Durant. Too, yeah, so. that almost happened. Yeah, I don't know if he's the greatest player. Yeah. I, I don't know if he, no, he calls the, me Kevin Durant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh no. Fuck no. you guys. I'm out of here. No, it's a, it's a it's a fun time for me right now watching sports. I mean, I got the Sharks right now and the. Uh, the finals or the semifinals, right? So we have about one more series to win before we go off to potentially the Stanley Cup and Warriors now, same place. Um, it's a it's, it's a really cool time for that's Bay good for the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah. Bear sports yeah. are cool this, to watch right now. Dude, I would love the Sharks, especially like right here in our backyard. If that took, dude, if, if we came back, would dude, that be and crazy? Won, you think people would go? Oh, the city shit? will go crazy. They'll have parades. It'll really? be awesome. Yeah, oh, I'll be there. Be cool. for that. Hey, be did awesome. you did you guys see the um, the article? I think it was uh, Jackie that shared it with us about uh, Arizona's new law on nunchucks. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't Lots know of nunchuck fans. I didn't there, know huh? that nunchucks were illegal in Arizona. Yeah. Well, remember weird. what a weird what, what, and like what's Remember we talked about New York like year what maybe a year ago we brought up that news when they outlawed Nunchucks. No, no. New York made Ninja Stars or something. It was Ninja Stars. Oh, yeah. it was Ninja Another Stars? One. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Ninja what Stars. What a great example of, of, of government hysteria. Like, kung fu movies come out and they're like, oh shit, these fucking kung fu masters are crazy. <laughs> they can't even stop them with guns. Ban all their weapons. Yeah, guarantee they're hurting themselves more than anybody else. It's an, yeah. an, <laughs> an answer to the rise of all the Ninja Turtle gangs. Yeah, dude. I'd be... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd be, I'd I know be, how we're going to stop these motherfuckers. Get him, Raphael! Yeah. I would be way more, like, seriously, if somebody pulled out nunchucks or somebody pulled out a bat, I'd way be more scared. scared of the bat. <laughs> yeah. Somebody pulled out nunchucks, I'd be like, let me see you use those like, first. I'm going to grab a rock yeah. and just throw it at your head. You ever try, you ever try to use nunchucks? <laughs> hella hard. Yes, it's hella hard. Bro. Oh, you hit yourself in the nuts every time. <laughs> I mean, it looks really cool. It, it reminds me a little bit of uh, Indiana Jones, where this guy's doing all these fancy moves he and everything, and he just shoots him in the head. Yeah, yeah. good old. Old, good old fashioned American. Yep. Did God, you see the other? Answer. Did you guys see the um, another another lawsuit for Roundup? Yes, Qu- uh, California, Oakland couple. Oh, it was Oakland? An Oakland couple got. You know, I'm gonna pull up the article just so I make Fascinating. sure. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah they, I got, I got they're t- t- like bleeding right now. Money. Well, so they got two billion in punitive. Da- so they they got two billion dollars in punitive damages after this jury concluded that sustained exposure to. Monsanto's Roundup Weed Killer, which is a glyphosate, which, by the way, they spray all over the fuck, all over your food, um, it, non-GMO crops in particular, um, because that's what they do. GMO crops don't die to Roundup, but everything else does, so it's an easy way to, to grow plants or whatever. This couple's going to get an additional $55 million for pain and suffering as well. Wow. So this was in uh, California, and, it, and it's because the jury believed that the exposure to this glyphosate, or Roundup, played a substantial factor in their development of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the type of cancer that the other guy who won wow. got also. And this is the kind of cancer that they're trying to make a connection to between glyphosates, is non-Hodgkin's type lymphoma. Now, what's it called when you get like the collective, like everybody bands together to class create action. class action? Isn't there, I mean, isn't that like inevitable now if they're pinpointing that to be a cause? Well, bro, this is a, like, people don't realize, okay, uh, it, if, if you take out the organic market, um, you know, and you just look at the the food market, a good eighty percent of the of our foods, processed foods, uh, contain some type of a GMO, whether it's uh, corn, wheat, or, or soy. Those are the major major crops, um, and wheat isn't GMO, but wheat does get sprayed with glyphosates uh, as a desiccant in America, so as, as a way to kind of get it to to get ready faster. So you're you're consuming these glyphosates uh, all the time, and they make a shit ton of money. Monsanto's a m- massive, powerful company. Oh, yeah. They send billions and millions of tons of, of of glyphosates overseas to China, which is the second, you know, the the world's second largest economy. So I don't know, man. What's going to happen? Is this company too powerful? Well, this was how are they going to get taken down? I feel like this is a lot of the motivation of why we we partnered up with Organifi. It's like, if, especially being in the fitness space, if you're going to be consuming, you know, powdered greens and powdered protein on a regular basis, like organic, on, yeah, yep. yeah, one hundred percent. All their products are organic. Yeah, I, that I, was a, that was an, a game. That was a, a deal breaker for us. Is that if we were going to sell your supplements and stuff. 
um, they had to be 100% organic. and so Because you know a lot of people are taking this every day or multiple times per day. Right. Yeah. Like how many people do you know that take a, at minimum a protein shake or two a day plus a green juice and then other supplement type products on top of that? And then on top of that, you're getting a lot of this stuff inside there? Like yeah. that just has always concerned me. Well, I know when I talked to, and I can't remember his name, Dr. Zach Bush, I believe, mm -hmm. who is a uh, triple board certified um, uh, doctor, brilliant man, um, and a bit of an expert on glyphosates. And he said that glyphosates, uh, you know, they, they do interact with the shikamati pathway of, uh, 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 or, or just I should just say the shikamati pathway, which exists in plants, doesn't exist in humans, so glyphosates don't bother humans. But it does exist in bacteria, mm. and so glyphosates act like a mild anti uh, excuse me antibiotic. Mm -hmm. um, oh wow, it, he compared it to that. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. because it kills bacteria. And so what we're doing is we're drowning the, the, our soil in glyphosates. So we're killing the microbiome that in, that's in the soil, and that stuff is important. The microbiome on the earth is important, just like your microbiome is in your gut. And then you consume it, and you get the residues in your gut. And who knows what that's causing? Right. And then he was bring, he was talking about studies that he saw that showed that that glyphosates also can contribute to uh, uh, intestinal hyperpermeability, aka uh, leaky, uh, leaky gut, gut syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, and cause all these food intolerances. So anyway, I, I mean, I'm, I always try to go organic. I don't mm -hmm. think it's the most important thing. I think <clears throat> macros and calories are obviously first. But then uh, close second, you know, third is like well, trying to get good been, sourcing. Yeah, I've always been alarmed by that. It's like if it's killing lig living organisms, if, if it's proven to, uh, you know, kill bacteria, we, I mean, how much of our body's made up of bacteria? Like uh, internally we're ingesting this stuff and it's like, uh, you, you know, maybe there aren't enough studies out there to really prove that people are dying, you, you know, like uh, immediately from this. But now we're starting to see this, you know, uh, you know, these cases come forward yeah, from yeah. chronic use. Yeah, we're pretty good at at not um, approving like immediately <clears throat> toxic stuff. Like, uh, there's I don't think you're gonna buy anything on the market that's gonna give you an immediate toxic uh, result or make you sick right away. Yes, but, otherwise it'd be labeled rat poison. Yeah, but what we're bad at is looking at long, long term trends because they're difficult. Like, imagine like you look at a whole population of people. <clears throat> And they all live to their 60, and you start noticing some trends. What contributed to the poor health? Was it, was it the glyphosate? Was it the lack of sun exposure? Was it this? Was it the food activity? Was it th like it's hard to narrow it down? So we end up saying it's safe because these three month studies show that it's safe. Right. We don't know if it's safe long term. What the deal is with that? So right. you know, I, I say, and, and organic isn't perfect either. By the way, uh, organic is is interesting. In its own right, but it's just another barrier. Uh, right? It's a another... lesser evil. I mean, that was even one of the deals with Organifi when we first started working with them was, you know, we're not going to present this message to people that you should be taking this every single day. We'll always promote whole natural foods first. Mm -hmm. You know, you should always try and target that first. The reality of it is that sometimes it's hard to hit protein intakes with natural foods. If you're going to take a protein powder, like I 100% recommend going the organic and, and route. Then, and then you got to be. You also have to do your research. Like uh, many times, organic plant proteins. They found this not that long oh, ago. The metals. The heavy metals, high in yeah. heavy metals. Um, now Organifi, uh, you know, showed us their their lab results, and they were totally clean. But some of the most popular uh, plant proteins, because Organifi is all plant, right? There's no dairy, no gluten, or whatever. It's really easy for people food intolerances. But there was other companies. Some of the top organic plant-based proteins out Surprising, there. Surprising, man. High amounts of heavy yeah. metals. Bad. That's toxic. Yeah, yeah reputable yeah. companies that were going down yep, for that. Yep, yep, yep. So you don't, you want to stay away from those. You guys see, um, I'm, I'm happy and excited. I've been talking about this for, God, probably over a year now. Um, you know, what I see in, uh, with Spotify, and I just think it's a, it's an amazing company. I think it's a, a smart company to pay attention to and watch. I also think that it's, it's smart for us to get involved on that platform with all the many things that we're doing. And so Mind Pump officially has a Mind Pump Spotify that Enzo has been organizing, and it's pretty cool. He's got a collection of, of guys and girls that uh, have certain genres that they love and listen to mm -hmm. all the latest and greatest. And so I think we're up to seven or nine uh, custom playlists, mm. and he's going to be forever evolving and changing it. And he actually even uh, opened up uh, an email, Spotify at mindpumpmedia.com, which is 
a place that if you're already listening to the playlist, you'll love the playlist. You have songs that you... Uh, or you're just like one of those critics or like, you don't have this and this and this. Right. Well, okay, tell us. Yeah, right. So you can email Enzo and he'll be he'll be taking that information. And, and potentially, I'm not guaranteeing that your song is going to make it to the list because it's yeah. got to make it through uh, everybody that's going through all of it. But we have started it. We have created it. It's under Mind Pump. It's on Spotify. Um, I just did a link on my Instagram. I'll probably do another one in a few days so people... Uh, can follow it, but check it out. It's so great because at the event, uh, I was talking, you know, to to some of the guys about uh, music genres and like metal and stuff, and we we're talking about Liquid Death and you know just how metal it is and the brand and everything. I'm like, yeah, and somehow we were talking about like different genres of metal, and uh, it, and then this guy brought up the this one genre that really perked my interest because. Uh, I had this idea. I was actually in a rockabilly band a long time ago where we had a stand up bass and like I was trying to play like old rock and roll, kind of like old 50s style kind of rock and roll. And uh, he said that there's actually a genre out there that uh, they've taken that now in the metal genre. They've taken rockabilly with a stand up bass and then they've added like, you know, really intense like What's it called? vocals. And uh, so there, there's it's called Gore Horseman is like one of the bands that embodies this, this style. I forget what the actual like term of the metal genre is, but uh, that's one of the bands that he turned me on to. I'm just like, I'm loving it. Is right it now. good? It's great. Is dude. it good to like lift to? It, it's it's super. Yeah, it's it's got a it's got a driving beat to it, like you know how rockabilly does, but it's 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 way more intense. I'm I'm totally digging it. But it's just funny because I had an idea of that when I was playing. I was like, it'd be awesome if we like incorporate like a stand up bass and all that. But it it sounds so weird. But it's like somebody thought of it, you know, and they came up with it. It's I, great. I've been lately. I've been list, lifting to uh, Slayer. Yeah, Slayer. Oh, yeah, oh, going back to the old classics. Slayer's good times, man. You want to break some PRs? Put on some Slayer. A little Angel of Death. Today's squad is brought to you by Maps Anabolic. If you're looking to maximize your overall muscle and strength, Maps Anabolic is the perfect place to start. With a full 30-day money-back guarantee, there is absolutely zero risk. So what are you waiting for? Go to mindpumpmedia.com and get started today. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. Quee-qua. All right. Our first question is from Jen Rose Smith. Can you explain the pros and cons of doing cardio before weight training versus after? I hate doing cardio, so if I don't do it first, then I won't do it at all. Oh yeah, so well, then don't do it. Yeah, <laughs> they've done they've done uh, qu- quite a few studies on the cardio before, cardio after, and the whichever one's adaptation you you prioritize is the one you should do first. So l- let me explain that. Let's cardio will. Uh, provide your body with a stimulus to adapt in a way that will improve your endurance, endurance, your stamina and endurance. Weight training sends a signal to get your body to adapt in a way to benefit you with strength uh, or power. Or building muscle. Uh, and building muscle. Now, uh, there's more attached to that. When your body's trying to get more endurance, it also tries to become more efficient with calorie burn. When your body's trying to get stronger and build muscle, it also starts to speed up, quote, speed up its metabolism and burn more calories. So if you're working out and your goal is to get more endurance because you're an athlete that needs more endurance or you're going to go f- do a run or whatever, like for example, if you're a marathon runner, you should do your cardio first. If you're trying to build your body, build muscle, sculpt your body, speed up your metabolism um, or get stronger, um, I would say go weights first. The vast majority of people that are listening to this podcast probably would do better off lifting weights first, but we're splitting hairs here. It doesn't make a huge, huge, huge difference. I think it's important to address the, uh, I hate doing cardio, so if I, if I don't do it first, then I won't do it at all. Yeah. Um, this is interesting, because it, but it's common, right? A lot of people still think that you need to do cardi- cardio if your goal is fat loss. You do not need to do cardio necessarily if your goal is fat loss. In fact, I've had way more success teaching people how to balance their diet and how to strength train properly with zero cardio with fat loss than I have ever had with somebody saying, I want fat loss, and then me prescribing cardio to them. 
you're you're going to get way more benefits by learning how to balance out your nutrition with no cardio and with just hopefully strength training because hopefully you like that if you are referring to the cardio portion that you hate i'm assuming that means you enjoy the weight training portion so do the portion that you love weight train give it your all train the way you want to train train the way you like mm-hmm. to train and enjoy that process and instead of because by the way 30 minutes to an hour of cardio we're talking about somewhere between 200 and 500 calorie difference uh, that, that by not doing that, right? So if you decide to eliminate cardio, if it's an hour, we're talking about closer to four or 500 calories. If it's 30 minutes, we're looking at more like 200, 250 calories of a difference. So you can change your diet, you know, eat 250 calories less in the day or find a way to do two or three 10 to 15 minute walks throughout your day to make up for that 200, 250 calorie difference. And you'll get pretty much the same benefits in 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 the uh, scheme of losing body fat. And health. That's the best way to do it. Right. Separate it completely. <clears throat> yes. You know, do your weights, do your weights. Uh, you want to do extra calorie burning, just do extra walking and activity um, throughout the day. That's got to be in my opinion, the best approach. Yeah, and, and two, I think there's still probably a thought process behind the cardio's being like a warm-up. Like, I got to get this blood circulation. I got to heat up my core temperature before I even get into working out. I know that's probably still, you know, rampant within people's thought process of, like, how to work out properly. But, you know, that's why we had to put out a program, Prime, where we really explain, like, there's a better way to, to set yourself up in terms of the movements you're trying to accomplish within your workouts and also just specifically to you. Uh, you know, what your joints would benefit from the most, uh, you know, going into, uh, you know, stabilize everything properly and function properly going into these workouts. Yeah, there's, there's also a belief that you need to do cardio to improve your cardiovascular health. So it's like weights improves the health of your muscles and your joints and your like movement. It, like it doesn't improve your, your cardiovascular. Exactly. Uh, y- y- look, if you want to get lots of endurance and you want to really get stamina, cardio is great for that. If you want to just improve the health of your cardiovascular system, just lift weights faster. I mean, it's mostly going to be strength training, yeah. but when you're sh- cutting your rest periods shorter or you're doing higher reps, like do a set of squats for 15 or 20 reps, you're going to get cardiovascular conditioning as well. So you can, you, let me put it this way. If your goal is fitness, long-term longevity, and health um, in the context of modern life, and you want to look good, and you have to pick weights, or cardio, weights all day long. All day long. You're going to get more carryover from the weights than you will get from the cardio. Cardio is not going to give you the strength and muscle building effects at all. It would be inter- I would. I wish you could do this. I wish we could, instead of a, a group of random people, we could do this like individual study. Like I, would, I wonder what, if I did 30 minutes to an hour of uh, you know, moderately intense cardio and then went to my hour of weight training, how much that impeded on my performance in the weight room mm-hmm. and how much that then impeded on my progression in building muscle and strength. Right. I wonder if you could compare that to not doing cardio whatsoever, which then led to a better, higher performing weight training routine, which then led to more strength and more muscle. And over the course of three months, six months of training that way, what the difference in fat loss and muscle gain and overall metabolism what they would be. I don't have that study to show that or prove that, but I do have a lot of experience in helping people. And I would argue that the latter is superior, Mm -hmm. that the person who has put the energy and focus on the weight training, building the strength, building the muscle over long term is going to get overall better fat loss, more muscle being built in comparison to the person that is prioritizing something like cardio, which they don't even yeah. enjoy doing. Unless you're really like trying to pursue the skill of running or biking or cardiovascular related. Totally and different. That's, that's a different subject completely. Totally but, different. Which is totally a valid way to train, but uh, that's that has a totally different uh, mentality. And there's no way this person is that person. Like yeah. you don't say I hate doing cardio and you have a cardio, go- you have a, a marathon you're training right. for. Right. right. You know yeah, what I'm saying? It's like not happen. this is somebody 100%, which is totally normal. So I don't want Jen to feel like I'm, I'm ragging on you. This is super common with clients that think that they need to do cardio because their goal is fat loss. Yeah. You absolutely do not need to do cardio if your goal is fat loss. Oh, it's it, been embedded in us with marketing. Right. And you know what, how I love to teach it is if we can figure out the right caloric balance that you need to be eating without any sort of cardio and just strength training. 
And then every once in a while, you intermittently use cardio to either one, combat a larger calorie day because, oh, you decided you're going to go to dinner with your girlfriends tonight. Therefore, I'm going to spend 30 minutes to an hour on the cardio today to help combat the extra calories that my body's going to be consuming. Far more far more uh, uh, beneficial to use it that way than it become a ritual that you do it every single time you train because like Sal alluded to earlier, that sends a signal to the body to become more efficient with calories. It then adapts to it. It doesn't give you the response that you're probably looking for if the ultimate goal is fat loss. No, ideally, it's it's weight training with uh, a good level of just natural steps throughout the day. Next question is from Shea Goes West. What should a woman's focus for fitness and health be through pregnancy, starting before getting pregnant to after giving birth? Oh, boy. Um, before, so I've, I've seen firsthand the effect of different, uh, approaches and strategies with fitness has had on women who are pregnant. I remember, you know, when I managed gyms, I had aerobics instructors who would have, we get pregnant. And then I had some trainers who got pregnant and the difference was in their training modalities. The aerobics instructors were super big on the classes, super big on the cardio, Lots of running, lots of aerobics classes, lots of dance classes. The trainers were into lifting weights. The The women that lifted weights bounced back way faster than the women who did the cardio. Now, don't get me wrong. They both bounced back, but bones, uh, <laughs> both bounced back very well, uh, but the weight training women uh, did the best. Now, as a trainer, when I started training women uh, through pregnancy, my focus was always let's get you strong, let's get you mobile, and let's get your metabolism nice and fast because what ends up happening is you get pregnant, your activity starts to decline. We're still doing strength training. After you have your baby, you're not active at all. Um, and you want to obviously, a big concern is can I get back to my pre pregnancy weight? Um, and of course, when you're look, the other thing too is giving birth is a that is a very exhausting endeavor and it requires a lot of physical strength. It really, really does. And so, and they've done studies on this. Women who are physically fit have far uh, have a higher percentage of successful births um, than women who are not. So, although all activity is important, I would say the focus would be on strength training. The focus would be on uh, you know your big compound movements, getting good mobility, getting good with your squats, your deadlifts, your bench presses, your overhead presses, and then during pregnancy, maintaining as many of those exercises as po- as, as long as you can. Listen to your body, of course. And start removing exercises as they start to feel uncomfortable. Um, and you should be able to stay active and, res- and lift weights appropriately all the way up until the day you give birth. Mm-hmm. This is kind of an interesting one for me right now because I'm in the middle of going through this with Katrina. And all of my years of training, I've trained lots of uh, pregnant women. And uh, I, I would say my advice it goes right along with Sal. I think the, uh, addressing the common mistakes I see. A common mistake is I'm I just got pregnant. Uh, oh God, I don't want to get super fat. Oh God, I want to be healthy. Yeah, time to get in shape. Right, time to get in <laughs> shape. Like that's a common mistake that I've seen before. Um, that is not the time to start your New Year's resolution or this all of a sudden this this vigorous routine of of lifting weights or doing cardio. Like that is not a, a, a good thing and that's not ideal, right? So uh, that, and then also if you're somebody who has already been training consistently, whether that be two times a week or seven times a week, doesn't matter. If you've already been training very consistently, uh, whatever amount of days a week, and then you get pregnant, I've seen uh, plenty of women that I've trained that I've maintained that level of fitness, uh, that they just keep right on pace with that. Now, a uh, little mistake sometimes you, you're not trying to progress during this time. Good chance you'll lose some strength. You know, some of your nutrients and energy is is being diverted into growing a baby inside of you. Uh, so this is and this is, I guess, maybe even newfound knowledge for me having to uh, actually witness Katrina go through some of these challenges herself and, and talking her through that. Um, she had a moment probably three months ago uh, where she kind of broke down a little bit because she felt so weak. You know, and that, and coming from an athletic background, a girl who's con- trained consistently forever, uh, to see herself go in the gym and do some of these exercises that she's two, three, four times stronger normally on, having to reduce the weight significantly was a shot to her ego, and uh, that uh, was a, a eye opener for me. And I feel that 
this was something that I had to kind of coach her through that process of, hey, it's okay. Uh, again, you're, you're, you're making a baby inside you. We're not trying to hit PRs. We're not trying to see sh- you're supposed to lose some strength right now. That's totally okay. Don't beat yourself up over it. What we want to do is just keep moving, keep the mobility up, keep your overall strength up. You don't need to be seeing gains right now. And if you mm-hmm. do see a little bit of regression, that's totally okay. Uh, there's lots of benefits too to uh, training your pelvic floor muscles. Um, Another common thing I I had with clients when they went through labor, uh, the ones that had the most success put a lot of attention here. Uh, The muscles responsible to helping you push through this this pregnancy are are related to that. And so if you are somebody who is doing exercises that promote that, it's really important because you have to have a good mind-muscle connection to all those muscles Mm -hmm. before you go into, especially if you are somebody who does opt to take some of the painkillers and the drugs that kind of numb that whole area. If you already have a poor connection to those muscles down there, you won't be able to push. Yeah, you just won't be able to push. And this yeah. is, uh, I see a lot of C sections happen because of this. You already have a poor connection to your your pelvic floor muscles, and then on top of that, you go into a pregnancy, and then you get uh, decide to take the, the the numbing drugs, and then now you can't feel those. Now you're asking it's like it's like asking somebody to flex uh, like their lats. Like flexing your back is a really if you've never really worked it. Yeah, and like, then on top of it, you you're yeah, blocking the signal. yeah, and then now exactly, and then you're yeah. numb on top of it. It's like good luck trying to do. It. And then and those are responsible or helping push this kid along. Well, no shit, you had a hard time, and no shit, it all of a sudden is like oh shit, we got to go do a C section because you can't push this kid out. So if you're somebody who wants to have a natural birth and you want to go that route, I. I I can't stress that enough how important it is to train uh, those muscles during pregnancy. Yeah, we just actually had a really in-depth conversation about this with Stephanie Grunk, yep. uh, who was on the show and, and really helped to kind of highlight basically everything, you know, like we're bringing up right now. I could just echo their points, but, um, you know, taking you through that pre, during and post pregnancy process, um, uh, that that's a great episode for you to look out for here in the future. Next question is from Christian Relo. What biomarkers such as blood sugar, blood pressure, et cetera, do you think will offer the most benefit to people when made conveniently available to the general public? Oh, interesting. Blood sugar. Yeah. I think yeah. blood sugar, I think continual glucose monitors have the potential to revolutionize yeah. the way people M- mainly uh, look be- at food. Mainly because of the individual variants, right? Exactly. Oh, I'm I mean, highlighting that like crazy. Well, this, the, the this studies is, on this are, are insane. Right. And I th- also think this is why there's so much controversy in what's good foods and what's bad foods. Mm-hmm. And and it's because- so polarizing everywhere. There's so, there's, I've, and this is what's cool about the glucose monitors and the ability to do this to Sal's point is that I could have one client that eats a cookie and, you know, through the roof- and and it's just super not ideal for that person. And then another person like nothing. And this this is explains a lot of what all of us have seen before. We've all had cl- friends or that person who can eat certain things that you know you can't eat, and they totally get away with it. And there, it's not like magic. There's just a reason for it. There's a there's a biological difference that you have with our genetic difference between the two of you. Your guys' makeup, mm. your epigenetics, and that uh, causes that person to totally be able to have that their body regulates completely normal and is fine and doesn't respond yours freaks the fuck out or the other way around theirs freaks the fuck out yours is totally fine does it and that's why you got to be very careful with giving nutritional advice and i think that this is going to this uh, ability is going to highlight that and just blow people's oh, minds. Yeah, it's another fingerprint you know it's an, we're, we're figuring that out like this biodiversity like we're so diverse uh, you know, chemically and, uh, you know, genetically that uh, it, it's been such a problem for us to kind of, you know, it, there are valid ways to eat. And, uh, you know, some people find it through structure in certain directions. And here's the thing, it highlights that. And here's why. And here's why it doesn't work for this person. And so, like, if we have more insight, uh, you know, like these continual glucose monitors, that's going to be nothing but helpful for coaches and for, you know, nutritionists out there. Yeah. So what they do basically is here's how a continual glucose monitor works and here's how they'll probably work in the future. Ex- Sal, explain the glycemic index first and how that works and uh, then the glucose Well, monitor. the glycemic index uh, tells you, it gives us food a score and it shows just how quickly that food is going to impact your blood sugar um, and how much it's going to impact your blood sugar. So, a continual glucose monitor you wear all the time. I'll eat a food and I'll see in real time 
Oh, there goes my my blood sugar. Oh, there goes my insulin following right afterwards. Now, what's weird about these, these since they've come out with these, is they've had situations where a person's uh, blood sugar will spike after they eat like an avocado. Mm-hmm. An avocado being a no sugar, no carbohydrates in it whatsoever. It's a fat food. And it's very, very low on the glycemic index, although this person eats it and their their glucose monitor goes off and they have a spike. What the fuck is going on, right? And so what, they, what they're speculating is that there's a, a, an immune response. So like this person may have a food intolerance to an avocado. They get an immune response. That causes the liver to release sugar very quickly. When you get an immune response, your liver's response typically is to release sugar into your bloodstream because it's a stress, any kind of stress. We'll do this. Even working out, I remember learning this with uh, one of my clients was diabetic. And after a good workout, his blood sugar would be controlled. If I pushed him too hard, his blood sugar would skyrocket. And, I, and when I was a young trainer, I, I didn't realize, I didn't understand this. How the fuck can that happen? And his doctor explained, oh, it's, if it's too intense, his liver is going to just pump. It's going to release a bunch of stored sugar. And so it's, what's cool about this is people are going to wear these things. It's going to be attached to an app. They're going to eat regular foods or, or whatever, enter into what the foods are, and over time, they're going to develop an understanding of their glucose fingerprint. And then when you're hungry, it's going to recommend certain things to you. Oh, I'm going to Carl's Jr. Oh, here's the options that you have a better response to. Here's the ones you don't. Oh, here's what foods that work better for you. Here's ones that don't. And you'll start to correlate that and connect it to how you feel. Like when you eat a food that dramatically spikes your blood sugar, you can tell. If it happens really fast and, and, and real high, you tend to get nauseous. Um, and then when it drops and crashes, you feel lethargic and you want to fall asleep. That's kind of the feeling of that. And of that there's a lot of, there's drop. a lot of connections to like cravings and stuff with all this too. Yes. Mm. And, and that's the stuff that I think that's really going to open people's eyes. Because at the end of the day, calories are the most important thing, right? So if all things are said the same with calories, it, it is what it is. But it'll start helping people connect like- How they feel. Right. Oh shit, when I eat this food- and it, the, my glucose monitor reads this. I also tend to want to overindulge and eat more of these mm-hmm. foods. And so you go, oh, wow, I see. That's that's good information for me to know now. It's not that I can't have that, and as long as I stay in my calories, I'm okay. But what I need to be aware of is those types of foods promote more cravings and me to have more, where if I make this choice, I also enjoy this mm-hmm. food, but it doesn't cause that. Oh, wow, if I'm trying to be in a calorie-restricted diet right now, I'm probably better off heading for these foods this is why uh, like old school trainer stuff like we used to teach people to to eat more low glycemic foods just in general this is going to be more specific to way them, which, more specific yeah way more it used to just be a generic thing it's like oh instead of you having you know sugar or fruit it might be better to have a sweet potato here well that's just because we know the difference in general as far as the glycemic index where we're now we're going to be able to tell yeah. and you know what'll be cool what'll be cool about this too is you'll be able to see how stress affects you through your glucose yeah. Like you have an argument with your spouse and you'll see your glucose monitor will show a spike in blood sugar and you're like, holy <laughs> shit. Cra- yeah, you stressed me out. Look at this. Yeah, look yeah. at this. You're, <laughs> not good, you're not good for my goals. <laughs> yeah, calm down. Next question is from Mr. James J. Cho. What should you look for in a business partner and what are some red flags that might not be so obvious? Oh, yeah. She needs to be handsome or sexy. Yep, yep. That's how we picked each other. She yeah. needs to be handsome or sexy. Why okay. do we mean she? Yeah, yeah. What's going on? So I'm confused. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. I, you know, uh, getting a business partner, people need to take that as seriously as like picking a life partner or a, you know, a, like a marriage. Um, you're tying up your finances. You're tying up your, uh, your business. Um, if you succeed... You could very well be working with this person or these people for decades. So do you want to meet with this person for for decades and talk to them and deal with them? If they annoy you now a little bit, they're probably going to annoy you way the fuck more in five or ten years. Um, so those are important things to pay attention to. Do you like this person? For me, a big one is honesty. Uh, I, that's number one. Like I need to know what I'm going to get with this person. I don't want to question someone's alt- motives. I don't yeah. want to decipher their language and think, are they trying to communicate something? I don't want to work with someone who isn't honest with the staff or employees who's manipulative. Um, these are common behaviors that you see in people. And some people think that this is what you need to be successful is to have these kind of, you know, behavior, you know, these type of characteristics. I personally 
for me, integrity was number one. Mm-hmm. And it's the number one reason why I enjoy working with uh, the guys that I work with now. Oh, I can totally echo that. I mean, integrity is everything. Like you, you know that right away based off of a lot of factors. But I think, um, too, in terms of like just trying to pinpoint one thing to kind of like keep your eyes peeled towards is um, – you know, when you get in rough patches and you when you have those failures that, that occur and how everybody reacts to those failures. Mm-hmm. And, you know, is it is it the pointing finger mentality or is it the ownership of the failure or, uh, you know, the collective like, OK, you know, that was something that all of us, you know, can do better on versus like I'm I am now coming after. Uh, you know, you for this and this for that. And it's a deflection more than internalizing it. I, you know, if I could go back and, and think of things that I would have told my younger self that got into partners on like a, a thing, an exercise that I would have done before I went into partnership with anything. One of the things that I would have uh, taught myself to do, which is sit down in a room, uh, decide uh, before you go into business with this person, write down uh, your five personal core values. What are your, your five absolute non-negotiables, extremely important to you at at the top five. And then I would ask that person uh, what theirs are. I wouldn't do the exercise with them. I'd want them to do it on their own time. And then I would want to do it myself. And then I would like to compare the two of them to see how exactly those align. And I would hope that I would have at least three or four of those similar core values Mm -hmm. in each other's five. If you have none that you share, that's probably a pretty good red flag that – you know, you guys may not be the best blend ever because their five most important things aren't even a single one of yours. And I think the 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 less of them that they have, the less of the ideal partnership, and the more of them the sh- that you guys share, the better the the partnership will probably be. Because when I look at our business and the core values, um, we we all one hundred percent agree on those. And they're it, identical. Yeah, they are. They're all they're all identical. And something that I think that. Uh, these something that I've realized that I, I found has been important, and it, we didn't write this down as one of our core values. But I think of when I think of uh, Sal, Justin, and Doug, um, is the selflessness. Um, I, it's it's crazy how how selflessness each one of these guys have. It's um, we we don't we don't need to be uh, the man. Uh, we are always willing to allow the other person to take charge of something or have something this time. And then the next time someone, else. and there's never been like this, this, this bickering over that. Like, I think that the, the humility piece was so important to the success uh, of this business. And that was something that I think that I, I wouldn't have thought to like really look deep into that, that I recognize now later on, like, wow, like that quality became so important later on in the business. Yeah. But I definitely would recommend to myself to write the core values down, make them write them down, mm-hmm. see if they align, have a discussion around that. Mm. And to Sal's point, 100%, it's maybe even more <laughs> important than the, the considering, considering who you're going to marry for the rest of your life. Because you could technically marry somebody and have less of legal issues that you would have in a business. With oh, bus- my gosh. Business with finances, with uh, 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 employees, uh, with lawsuits, uh, with uh, the, the money that is being uh, mm-hmm. and consumers. There's so many other factors that are being uh, that are uh, being touched. That if you don't align with your partner, uh, like right in line with them on all those things, it could just only be a mess only thing head. worse than a, a failing business because of a bad business partner is a successful business with a bad business partner. In my opinion, <laughs> could you imagine having a wealthy company but working with you know pieces of crap that you don't trust or yeah. you don't want to work with? That would be a, oh. a, a kind of a, a nightmare. More common than not. I know, you I know, know, I know. The, here, stressful. Here's the other one. Can this person take criticism? That's a big one. Mm. Yeah. That is a big yeah. one because you don't want to be in a position with a partner that you feel like you, you have to hold your tongue uh, because that'll build into resentment. Just like with a with a marriage or with a, with a girlfriend thing, or boyfriend. Yeah. Same. You want to be able to tell them, like sit them down, like, hey, this thing that you're doing, not working so well, this thing is dumb, maybe you should do more of this. How does that person take that criticism, and then do they hold a grudge, uh, or do they take it, you know, you know, uh, and, and internalize it and say, okay, this is something I need to work on? That's a big one right uh, there. To that point, yep. you you have to you have to respect them as much as you respect yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the ability for us to do that is that there's this uh, this equal respect and admiration that we all have for each other. 
that if Sal or Justin or Doug sit me down and they're like, hey, bro, you're fucking up or hey, bro, you know, I didn't like what you did here or I don't I disagree. I mean, we could we openly use that term. I disagree. No, I disagree. And we do. <laughs> yeah. We say that a lot with each other. And <laughs> and it's completely well received, I think, on both ends, because when we, we've already learned this about each other a long time ago, when one of us is arguing and saying I disagree, it's not a personal thing like I disagree. You're wrong. I'm right. It's uh, I disagree that it's not the best idea for the business. And right. let's hash this out. I let's challenge that. Let's idea. argue about it right yeah. now so we can all hear it. And then we could all come together and agree or disagree on something. I mean, it's fuck yesterday. We had a, a conversation around potentially bringing in some sort of a consultant and we're all talking and it's not personal and every, you know, some agreeing, disagreeing all back and forth. And it just creates this great dialogue. No, eventually what ends up happening, not always, but eventually what ends up happening is somebody makes a good point. And I love this because at one point, uh, like I'll use the example of yesterday, we're all kind of going back and forth and we're on the fence about something. And then Adam said something and he says, well, I met with the person and, and they just didn't sell me on, on the idea. And, immediately because I respect him immediately I'm like okay well I, I, I'm gonna go with your right. I respect you enough to know that you know if the guy sold you he would have sold you on it. if he didn't it's probably not gonna sell me either and uh, that only comes from respecting the people that you work with if you don't respect the person you work with phew, Boy, you're going to have a tough one. That's rough. You're going to have a rough yeah, one. that's really rough. Look, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. Do it now. They're all free. Uh, also, check us out on Instagram. Justin can be found at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Cup Zero. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.